Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Sebastian DiStefano, and um, uh, my role at Adobe, my, my, my job is senior director, uh, or senior manager of strategic development globally at Adobe for higher education. But my side gig and my passion is director of the Creative Campus Collaboration uh, at Adobe. This is something that we've been doing over the last five years that is really, uh, you know, why I get up in the morning and why I go to sleep and why I love my job because I get to meet amazing people like Eddie uh, when I collaborate with all of our institutions uh, all over the world. So, and today really the Creative Campus Cafe is more of an informal conversation about some of the themes that we talk about when we have our in-person meeting called Adobe Creative Campus Collaboration. And some of those uh, themes all center around student success um, and in the form of digital literacy. And so the topic today, the debating digital literacy, we're gonna get a little bit into it. But before, before we start, I'd like to introduce my guest, Dr. Eddie Webb, and uh, make a quick introduction. Ed, uh, Eddie, let everyone know who you are. Uh, Eddie Webb, I'm a faculty at Mesa Community College and director of the new uh, Media Lab experience uh, there on, on campus. Well, I have a lot to say once, once we get going. Here, yeah, so. and so what I wanted to do is just start off with a little bit of a history of you know what um, the creative for those of you that don't know what the creative campus program is this is a, a, a group of institutions that Adobe's partnered with that it's made digital literacy the pillar of why they're partnering with Adobe and providing creative cloud to faculty and students in their campuses and so we have a handful of institutions that have done this um, and the theme around digital literacy uh, for them is the main connector for Adobe and that's very exciting because the perception people have of Adobe uh, broadly in education is that we are really a great solution when someone wants to have a creative career and utilize digital tools to have a professional career and go into the workforce. Um, but as we uh, learned over the last five years, um, that create creativity isn't just your creative professional. Uh, and some of the tools that um, if they're utilized in pedagogy in the right way, they can really enhance learning outcomes and help uh, educators like Eddie really teach students um, the skills they need to, to get into the workforce or develop better learning skills as they go to learn other things. Um, so that's what our Creative Campus Collaboration and Creative Campus Program is. I'm not gonna get too pitchy with the slide and all that stuff. This is really more about a dialogue. So imagine Eddie and I are sitting in, in a cafe and having a conversation and I do have my coffee. I don't know if Eddie has his coffee. I might have a nice branded Creative Campus uh, mug. Uh, so that's what the theme is today and um, we're gonna get deeply into the, the, the debate of digital literacy in a few minutes. But I want, Eddie, I'd love for you to kind of share a little bit about yourself, but I'll start by saying that when I, I first met Dr. Eddie Webb, uh, when we did a Creative Campus uh, thing called Adobe Edumax, and it's a large event we do, and he came up to me at the end of the day and he said, Seb, I think you need to learn a little bit about some of the things I'm doing at the college I teach. And I didn't know Eddie was my first introduction to him. And I said, wow, I'd love to hear more about it. And over time, as, as we started to learn a little bit more about each other, um, some of the work that Eddie's been doing is really incredible. So, you know, my experience with Eddie was a few years, about three years ago. Um, and I, I do, I work a lot of conferences and shows and I have a lot of people that come up to us to talk about a lot of things about Adobe. And I was just so happy that he wasn't complaining about something Adobe did. He was like, I think you, you need to learn what we're doing because it's really amazing what my students are doing, the outcomes we're getting, and some of the some of the uh, successes we're having. And a lot of it has to do with Adobe um, in a way that you may not you know, be aware how we're using Adobe in our teaching outcomes. So uh, I really want to thank Eddie for coming up to me and saying, hey, we're doing these amazing things I'd love for you to learn about because our relationship has gone from there over time and has just um, been really, really an incredible thing. And it's grown over time. Your relationship with Adobe has grown over time. So I would love for you, Eddie, to kind of share a little bit about who you are, what your journey was to get to where you are today, and some of the things that you're passionate about. Um, and it doesn't have to be in relationship to Adobe. We're, we're going to get to that a little later. But get, let us know you a little bit better. Um, uh, let people know who you are and what your background is. Okay. Um, can I, can I, do you want me to get into the slides I prepared or do you just want me to? No, just tell me, you, you tell me who, yeah, we can, we can wait. And if some of that is in the slides, please do. Yeah. Because I know yeah. you're, you know, a strong visual storyteller. So absolutely yeah. jump into the slides if you want. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I have I have some slides I've put together mostly to keep myself on track. Um, but, you know, the, the story that I have is uh, growing up, you know, um, um, in, uh, in, in, in California, uh, growing up in a, I, I guess you would say, bicultural, biracial uh, situation. And um, early on, you know, um, going to my uh, going to our native uh, ceremonies and things like that and having this sort of uh connection with storytelling and oral tradition and, and all of this and then sort of leaving all of that to go play around in the world and get in a lot of trouble and then find my way back to uh to those fires and and and, and to that community and a part of that uh, recovery for me from elders was to go back to school, uh, and so you know it's been a it's been a journey since then of learning all of this stuff and 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 how language works and what language is for and how powerful uh, storytelling is and reading people like Leslie Silco and Scott Mamaday and Simon Ortiz and 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 then you know writing some of my own stuff and then becoming friends and colleagues and, you know, working with them and being around. My dad would take me to, uh, you know, some uh, kind of activism stuff, American Indian type stuff. And so I learned about social justice and all of that. And I, the conversations you have had years ago, and I'm, I'll show you some of those slides here in a minute, whenever you're ready for me to do so. Uh, you know, was just, again, finding uh, the tools that gave me a way to express my own uh, journey as well as embracing my community. Mm -hmm. And it's just it, nothing about that has really changed for me. Right. Other than I, I think I've matured in the in what I'm trying to do, you know, and I, I have some so work you're doing is really focused on giving back to your community. You know, yes, that's something I see in your work that is at the forefront of what's driving you and what you're, you're kind of, I don't want to say mission, but that's how you're, you're, you're doing that. And it's a core of, you know, some of the things you want to achieve with your students. And that's the connection I saw in your story is a lot of educators do that. But I think when I see the work that you do, there's such a purpose for that for you. And, that, you know, I'd love for you to just kind of describe why is that a driver for you, you know? How important is it in the learning process that that is a part of, you know, your mission, right? Let me let me grab this screen real quick. Go for it. And if everybody could let me know, uh, Melissa, are we on? Can you all see my screen? We cannot right now. We cannot. So share screen. Uh, too many video. The stream is limited to four screens, so I guess... You need, oh. you need something there. Uh, Let's try that again. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right. There we go. Can we see it now? You can see it. Yeah. All right, I'm slide you guys over here. So in my work, you know, when I would come to the conferences and we were constantly debating about should Adobe be in the classroom or should documentary filmmaking be a part of the language uh, experience, especially in English composition and writing? For me, I just, over time, I just got tired of that and wanted to move on, that we're past that. This is the way these young children here, these young students, these young scholars are using language. This is their world. And by introducing these tools to them, not only are, are, have we, do I get to experience giving them, you know, empowering them to tell their own stories, it's actually made their research and their writing more meaningful to them. They actually right. write better. They research better because they have this purpose. Yeah. And where I'm at, Seb, uh, is this. Uh, you know, I've said this many times on stages where, if you're not taking on the man in your 20s, you have no heart. If you're still doing it in your 40s, you have no brain. 
And I say that in terms of this, and this is, this is a thought process that I've learned from a couple of native leaders that were influential in my life as a young artist. Uh, and so it's really about liberation, not revolution, because liberation is, motivates me to do what I do because I love my community. I love my people. I love our culture. I love our language. I love our land. I love all of that. And I and that's where I want my heart to be. I spent many years in this other place, you know, of always taking on the system and doing all of this. And what the tools of Adobe gave me were a way that I don't have to do that anymore. Right. I can just shift to being free and telling my story. Right. And what we've learned is we do that. <clears throat> um, here's a couple of places where people can look. But as we do that, what happens is this. And so we now have so much production, podcasts, documentaries, social justice papers, all of this stuff that we no longer have. We're not in that part of taking on anybody. We're, we're just being authentic. And that in and of itself is the change, right? right? And but so, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add, so in some of the things you've done, what is, how did you arrive at the, why is this still a debate? You know, how, what are the struggles of having a constant debate? Is that just a part of how academia gets to a point? Or is that, is there a legitimate, you know, struggle for other, there's a lot of faculty on this uh, web, uh, webinar and the polls have said that there's, you know, they're struggling with one area, which is faculty awareness, but there seems, you know, your struggle with this being a debate and we kind of are on the same page of kind of it's kind of over and you're sh you're showing you're demonstrating why it's over but give me a sense of how come this is still a debate because i know that in your institution there was a time where this continuously was debatable and you and you did that kind of uh fight that debate to get to the point where you're having impact so how come it's still a debate in your mind? Well, you know, having finished a dissertation in Adobe New Media Labs and higher ed, um, you know, I think there's many, many layers to it. I think the, the initial uh, realization that I had that it was more about faculty technophobia, mm -hmm. that there was faculty that would probably embrace this medium and this media production if they had a skill set that they felt comfortable teaching. And it is a lot at the beginning to ask of people. And right. then I think it moves in. I'm in, I've always been in the English department. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it moves into um, the written word, uh, you know, uh, of, of what our mission is, is to teach people to write well instead of um, express themselves well. Uh, communicate, let, you know, there's a bigger uh, scope to language and what it's for. So, you know, just on the surface, I think those are the two. I mean, for me, I started because I was already had gone to film school. I have a MFA as well. You know, I already had all the cameras and lights and stuff. And I was producing all of this stuff just in my classroom. Right. Uh, b before, you know, the uh, district really said, you know, we want this. They started supporting us because they saw the work. And I think, can we let the students tell the story, answer your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's, let me show you this. I think this is important. My name is Junior Siale, and I'm a part of the new Media Live Experience, English 102. Last semester I was in English 101 and um, I didn't expect much from English. I was taking it for my major uh, just so I can um, have those credits and move on with my life. I never really was great at English. I could write a paper and get an A in class, but I was never interested. You know, my first impressions uh, coming into an English class, uh, I was never, I've never really been a strong writer. I've always struggled in that aspect of kind of expressing myself. Um, expressing the words that I want to write. I remember through high school all the papers we had to write and I never really understood what we were writing about, what was the purpose of it all. 
Uh, and then when I, when I got to English 101, Professor E presented an idea of, of elevating uh, sort of, sort of what, what we're writing. But when we came in here, uh, not only was the room a different experience, but Professor Webb made the class a different experience. We would sit together uh, like a conference room and communicate and collaborate on all of the projects that Professor Webb gave to us. When I first came into English uh, 101 with Professor Eddie Webb, um, it was different. He gave off a different vibe than a regular English teacher and... We learned to uh, take the written word and, and turn it into video. And how we did that was we started with the I Am Project. And it really intrigued me because me as a person, I didn't really know who I was and just who I am as a person, what I, what I, my values, my religion, my respects. Uh, dig deeper into what us, we are as people are. And he did this by uh, introducing Premier. He had us write the paper about ourselves and the I am piece, and then had us produce a video using Adobe Premier. We took that essay that we wrote and we turned that into visual by taking pictures of our family, by taking pictures of where we're from, and taking pictures of, of who we are. And In reality, taking something two-dimensional and making it three-dimensional. Adding this layer of media that would show our words, uh, put pictures behind those words, and, and to help, it create a, it help us create a deeper meaning. In all reality, I, I feel like the New Media Lab, this, this project, these, these ideas, uh, helps help help me personally free my voice. Each group had to do a four to five page essay about what we learned about. And then we had to later turn that into a film. I was part of a research group that produced the water documentary and we divided each other with in two groups with facts, data, research and result and solution. And we each had a had like a position to look for facts for why there's dirty water, and a solution of what we can do to prevent there being so much dirty water. And finding out what's the truth, you know, fact checking everybody else to make sure that holding each other accountable. We wanted to make sure that our video was credible, the facts were there, the research was there. With the water video, um, when we're, when you write something and you write it on paper and you say the water is dirty, okay, you, you see, you're saying that the water is dirty, but in a video you can, visually see how dirty it is. I mean, we're moving into an age where um, people want to see things. Like YouTube is, is growing tremendously videos. People are, are expressing themselves, expressing their ideas through these different media forms, through videos, through pictures, through podcasts. Using Premiere and Photoshop and all of the other stuff, we got to experience making something incredible like our water video. We got to experience all the different steps into creating the video that it helped us understand that it may be all these little tedious things, but then at the end of it, you can see this short video or long video and you can see how it all comes together and it pulls really well together and it just looks amazing. It's, it's the future, I mean, it's so practical these applications that we're learning here in, in this English class, in this media lab, that I feel like it's almost a door to a whole different world. I'll be able to do this now uh, with these new skills I've been able to learn. I'll be able to tell a story. It may not be a standard five paragraph essay, but each picture, each video, each interaction that you, know, you record is part of a story. And that, with that, you have the responsibility to, to put that in order and to make it something that uh, people will remember forever. It's awesome. I've seen that so many times. It just always reminds me of the kind of uh, voice that students have when they go through a uh, learning experience the way that you designed it in the new Adobe Media Lab. I, we have a question, but I, I would love for you to go deeper into the process, uh, how you arrived at that. Um, we have quite a large representation uh, in the room who are charged to do, deliver the learning outcomes. So with the breakdown and the polls, you don't, you don't need to look at them, Eddie. 
Um, but I think we have an audience of peers that want to understand more details of how you did it, what your plan was, how you set up. So maybe you can go a little bit into that um, okay. uh, for a few minutes. Well, when you have students like the ones that just made that video, it definitely makes your job easier, right? right. Uh, and then we just moved on from that. We have multiple. We just did a native seed uh, revitalization. We have American Indian podcast. Um, I think it was wise that at the time we had we, we had some uh, innovative leaders, and we aligned all of our work, of course, with our mission. Um, and students helped develop all of this stuff of what they wanted. We started uh, uh, gaining uh, partnerships out in the community, which was really helpful. We we produced three PSAs uh, for the fire department. One of our students did something for police, nursing, and we made ourselves valuable because people looked at our work and realized how important it was. And so, as we grew with our individual projects, we started building this community of support and partnerships. And that really, really helped our administration, you know, it really kind of like, why would they want to resist this? Right. Right. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And so then now what we're doing is we've created what we call our uh, guides, our student guides. So students have helped us. We put these together to help. Students are helping faculty learn. And so we have all of these guides around Photoshop, Premiere, Spark. We love Spark, Rush, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we designed a, a room that's specific so that we can do learning and research here, production, and then we have a new podcast area. And, you know, it just goes back. Um, again, to humans connecting to language, you know, um, that's, that's the thing, right? And for me, as a young guy, kind of getting into a lot of trouble around identity issues and economic and all that stuff, I found my way back through language, right? And one of the very first things that I came in contact, uh, always, this is my daughter and my uh, Ikhlisi, my grandmother. And without them, of course, I wouldn't be here. Right. Um, so, you know, the very, one of the first projects that I did as a returning student and kind of people back in the day thinking, ah, oh, the guy's kind of an artist, crazy guy, but maybe he's got something going on. And the State Department in California let me write this book. And that's where I, I learned, first learned about Photoshop and InDesign, right? And I think back then it was even, uh, the PDF was sort of a big deal, right? right. And so as, as I went through it, I just, the journey was connecting imagery and oral tradition to science, right? And I was talking about, you know, oral tradition, the stories that tribes, indigenous people, and that could be Ireland or, you know, South Dakota or all over. People are all indigenous somewhere. And these stories that we carry uh, are, they're not cute little fables, you know. And that's, I think, a big part of our success as well, is that our work is grounded in solid research. Mm -hmm. It's not... It's not letting go that part of those in the language arts who think that MLA or APA or annotation or, you know, critical analysis, we do that better. We do that better now because our students are really invested in their projects. And so, you know, as time has gone on, this has been, you know, our uh, chancellor, all of our chancellor, provost, all of them have been behind us. We're rather big school, you know, we're looking at, I mean, before what's happening with us right now, at least we were, right. you know, well into the over $200,000. Uh, here, here's something really crazy that I put in here is, you know, Mesa, uh, Mesa here in Arizona, a very conservative 
uh, town and all of that. They gave us this big award. The business people in our community gave us this business, this big award. And I wasn't even sure how they, they knew about us, but they asked me, I got a letter and they wanted to see what we were doing. And they, they valued the work that our students are doing with business. That's, that's remarkable. Yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely remarkable with a guy to walk out on stage with hair down to my waist and then hand me a big old fat check and say, again, I don't know exactly what you guys are doing, but just keep doing it, you know? Um, and then last, and then, cause I want to get to the talking with folks, but yeah. I think, I think the last part of this is really understanding dynamic link. And I've used this now beyond just the uh, coding of how you can link, you know, Photoshop with uh, Premiere, with After Effects, and interface all of this technology. Uh, I think Dynamic Link, the concept and the technology is some of the most significant technology in modern history. And when, when you can get empowered by these apps inside of Adobe, it really, what I like to say, it starts to connect us and the language to our own humanity. Mm -hmm. and, and then people like can see it for years, for years. I tell people I'm a 25 year overnight success, you know. I mean, for years I would get, I'm just scrolling through stuff, everybody. And you'll, I guess you'll get some of this. I, I, I think it's also important to know that if you start on this journey in traditional settings, it is a bit of a disruptive process. And you need to be prepared for that, um, you know. But for years, I would get these amazing research papers, and I'm the only one who sees them, right? Right. And as you know, like if I was on stage right now, I would walk out with a handful of these research portfolios and throw them down on the ground and say, "Can you all see these and read them?" And you know, no. But now you can, and so. Uh, we have layers of our training that we do, uh, but this is the most important part here, is taking the written research into original production. Right. We have tons of it. I'll, uh, I think I really want to stop there. And can we yeah. have it? Is that cool? We have a little talk. Yeah, people, uh, everyone, Eddie's presentation, he's using Spark. If you're not familiar with Adobe Spark, uh, you can click on the link that's there and go to his presentation um, and see some of the videos and work that the students have done and in the process and strategy that Eddie devised to create the Media Lab um, there as a reference. And there's other resources that Eddie can provide too. When, when we do these kind of engagements, and I'm just really fortunate that everyone I've met has always offered to talk to other educators and share what they're doing. This is why we're a community, the education community. So, you know, Eddie's information's on that Spark page and connecting with him directly, if, if that's one thing I can do for all of you, there's something in what he's talked about, makes a connection for you, uh, please reach out to him um, and, and connect with him and have the conversation in places that there was a gap today that you need to know more about. Uh, there's only so much we can cover within the time that we have. Um, so, you know, that Spark is there for you guys to look at and Eddie has his information there for you to reach out to him. But Eddie, I wanted to talk a little, go back a little bit to kind of, you know, what's happening today in the work that you're doing, because people may be viewing that and seeing the physical environment that the students are in. And we all know that we're dealing with uh, physical limitations with the pandemic that we're living through today. And education is being impacted uh, worse, I think, than any other segment. Um, uh, maybe the movie theaters might open one day, but it's a real struggle for education right now to understand how do we deliver our mission for teaching and learning when we can't be together. So maybe you can share a little bit of some of the things you experienced in the last couple of months and how your media lab is adapting to it or offer up any kind of advice for folks who are maybe having the same kind of similar struggles um, in their environment. Well, I think one of the things that we quickly did was we opened up a Cranium Cafe. So we're available, you know, from eight to four to right. tutor students because, you know, 
we've trained over 78 faculty now uh, wow. at Mesa, and we are putting labs on all 10 campuses. And so we're continuing to, uh, we have a Adobe New Media Lab Academy that we're getting ready to launch. Mm -hmm. and so we're going to be holding workshops and trainings district wide. <clears throat> so because of the situation we're in, it's just another uh, way, you know, to teach. So again, back to dynamic link. Fortunately for us, our campus closed down in April. Right. So we had a lot of footage. So now we're just uh, teaching students with our student guides of how to share assets, right? right? And, and how to put all that up in the cloud. And, and we've created more and more tutorial, video tutorials and step-by-step. -step. So it's just another opportunity, which is good because in the industry, if students want to go into filmmaking or whatever, you have to know how to use data and share data you know, with a lot of different people on a project you're working on. Yeah. So yeah, we don't, we don't get to go back to school till next spring. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's what we're doing. We're trying to stay in contact like this. And right. is this the irony of all ironies that, you know, arguing for media and all of that and people that were no, no, no. Well, now everybody has to. Everybody has to sit here and a video and audio and microphones and nowhere to put. Everybody has to do it. And so, yeah, and they want to get good. I, I want you to address that a little bit as an educator when you kind of have the option to do things and all of a sudden you're, you know, have to do it or forced to do it because of the conditions we're, we're living in. Do you feel that if we get through this, when we get through this and what the future will look like, do you feel that as someone's had to do this, that they're, it's hard for them to go back to what they were doing before? Do you think there's enough benefits, inherent benefits, and in the way that they're asked to be teaching students or devising a different pedagogical approach because of this, that it's that it's going to get reset when the doors open? Or do you think there's enough benefit of the type of work that you're doing where it will continue to grow and change and be iterative and add more in the future? It's going to grow. Um, I'm sure there will be people that want to get comfortable again. Um, and, you know, there's that's one of the things that I have been a voice for is right. that we don't want to lose all of this great teaching experience and knowledge. That should always come before the technology part. And right. so we always want to make sure that's why we're creating the, the guides and that. But, but we're – the there's no turning back. Right. Um, I mean, our school just announced uh, they've got funding and they have a, a, a department that's going to help faculty start making their own videos. Right. And, and so, yeah, there's no, there's no turning back now, you know, the debate truly is over. And now you, it's, yeah. we're good at, yeah. you, you, you've trained 78 faculty um, and there's a lot of people here that are probably you know, part of what they're doing on their campus. What was that like from the faculty that came on board? You know, were they kind of willing participants? Were they hands up saying, I need to do this? Or were there, was there even resistance in that group of faculty of trying to do this? Share a little bit of that insight for everyone. Well, I think there's always resistance to change, right? I mean, that's just a natural part of anything. People have invested years in developing curriculum and lesson plans and lectures. And so you have to make sure when you uh, put on trainings that people understand this is not a way, you know, this is going to make all of that better, mm -hmm. right? So there's always a little bit of resistance. But again, I would say it goes back to the, the uh, technophobia really kind of a little bit of anxiety about can I manage this kind of data in front of a, a class? Right. And, and so there is, but for the most part, as soon as people watch that video I showed here and looked some of our other work, they want to, you know, they're ready to jump into the river as we say. And uh, then it's, you know, putting in a little bit of time, but with things that you all have put out with spark, uh, page, Spark, Video, and Rush, 
they are again that dynamic link they they set a, a very workable easy platform for faculty to engage in this work and then for those that want to get into premiere and after effects they can so it's staggered it's a process um, so what, one of the things that I know about you is that you do know the tools really well because of your experience. What would you advise for those out there who are, you know, not feeling like they're masters of the technology and might be more <laughs> afraid of introducing those these kind of, you know, learning outcomes into the curriculum when they're not, you know, really great at the tool? Because I, I hear that a lot. You know, I, it's hard for me to teach something if I don't really understand how to master the tool. I don't know if that's necessary. I'd love to have your input is what would you kind of share with others and that you might might have run into that with some of the people, faculty you've trained. Two two important things on that point. One, you do have to put in your time, right? There's tutorials all over the place on how to use whatever whatever app you want to use or wherever you want to enter. Uh, Spark, Page, Video and Rush are very very easy. You're going to have no problems with that. This is the second point that, to me that was the most exciting point because I can see over my career where I, I transitioned from being a teacher to an educator. Right. And the difference there for me is I no longer had to be the expert in the room. I remember it was maybe 10, 12 years ago where I wanted to go down this road. I think we were still buying Premier on little discs. I think I had one around here somewhere. Uh, I have every version of it, you know, and uh, but you have to walk. You you have to understand that you may no longer be the expert in the room. Right. Your students trust me on this. Your students know this technology. Yeah. So you're, you, it may be the faculty holding up the whole room. So if you can let go of that for a minute and find your and empower and really build. We talk about learning community, we talk about equity, we talk about diversity, but the say, the, what do they call it? The sage on the stage, um, chill a little bit on that and just create an environment where your students, you can say, I, I can tell you when I started out, Paul Hickey, uh, who works with me, was my student and he taught me more about this technology than anyone. Uh, he's my teacher now. Uh, yeah. Keegan Shofta, who's one of the best premiere and After Effects guys I've been around, uh, absolutely amazing. And you open yourself up to saying, hey, you know, I don't know. Just be honest. Right. You know, I want to do this part. But, you know, so you it, it, it really pushes you into being a part of a learning community. And yeah. if you're still hanging on to it's your show and you want to be, you know, it might be a tough road for you, but you know, let go a bit and you will, your students will bring you along. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah no, you did. You did. There was a question in the Q and a pod and folks, if you have questions for Eddie, just put them in the either. We'd love for you to put them in the Q and a pod. It'd be easier, but if you have to put them in the chat pod, that's okay. Uh, you know, one of the questions from Brian J. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, can we learn a little more about the assignment? You know, sounds like the students were asked to convert, or remediate a written document into a video, what was the prompt? A little deep in the weeds, but can um, you answer that for him? Sure. Uh, and I have, you know, I have a, a lot of uh, work coming out on that. We're trying to work that out right now. It's called Steps. Um, and that's where I get into like rubrics and, you know, your basic traditional way of evaluation. Um, but again, what I do is we have, uh, if I have a classroom now, I've, I've only have a classroom of 25 students. Mm -hmm. And so we, we divide those into small groups, four or five groups. Each group has to propose a topic that they want to research and make a documentary about. And mm -hmm. then we collectively create a rubric of how we're going to evaluate. And as every teacher knows, students are way harder on themselves than, than, than we are, you know, but I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty simple thing. The research part is very traditional, uh -huh. uh, you know, and then the, the turning that into video is, uh, you know, we, we have to have the labs so that all the computers are interlinked and 
they can work on, you know, on their uh, premiere and stuff like right. that. Again, I hope I'm answering your questions, right? Yeah, you know, if there is a place where you can share some of the specifics around the prompts and stuff in your links, you know, I know that this community would really appreciate that. Um, you know, so the beauty about the Spark page, it can be updated, but anywhere you can point them to some of the work yeah. that you kind of think is going to be really helpful for them. Um, there is another question by our own Adobe, Todd Taylor. Being authentic and building community and connection to language and dynamic link are your big ideas. Uh, how do those outcomes help students build careers beyond college? You know, so where does, you know, I've heard your students say this from their, you know, own uh, voice of how important it is for their, for their work, you know, beyond college opportunities. Share a little bit of that. Well, it, that's just, you know, that's a slam dunk, no brainer. You know, when they leave here, I think that's why this, the city gave us an award, that they saw the value, the skill sets our students were learning and how it transcends into business, right? I mean, people are being paid right now to keep an eye on us and all this technology and screens, yeah. and, right? And, and, and knowing how to work in this, uh, in this world of uh, media. You know, so, um, yeah, just make, it, it does all of the old competency stuff. It makes mm -hmm. people better people. It makes people better citizens. It makes people, they have a, when you've given people who come from underprivileged, underserved communities a voice right. where, it, you know, because I got into this thing this last, you know, couple weeks with people of, of all this that's happening in the country and we want change. Why, why do I always have to be angry? Right. right. When, why, why do you want to label me or paint me with, you know, being angry about, you know, why, why can't it be intelligent? You know, why, why can't it be strategic? And that's what we also do there is whatever issues that these students take on. And I don't, I don't give them a topic. Right. Right. They pick their own. I give them category, social justice, political, you know, whatever they want to do, position. Right. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, it just makes people better communicators, you know, it gives them the skill set of what we're doing right now. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that answer beyond college because my son in where I live in Ontario uh, the English curriculum is very multimodal based and they've learned digital skills much like you're doing in your class, maybe not in the same setting, but he's been asked to, you know, produce and write in the forms of media that you're talking about. And uh, this summer, you got an internship using those skills. He's been in university a couple of years and the opportunity for him to find employment was exactly in this area. And he came to me and said, Dad, the things I did in high school helped me get my job. And the two things I've done in university didn't maybe it did help me get the job, but I feel like what I did in high school in English was helping me get my job that I have now. And so he's helping the institution produce the content in the fall that they're going to be going online. So they've hired a you know 25 students to make this content and you know be more engaging. It is really interesting that the skill he didn't really identify that that is something that could connect him or separate him in uh, in the workforce. And all of a sudden he's he's got a job because of it. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I've heard your students say it. I'm living it myself with my own son in, in the impact that these skills help develop. Uh, and it's not just a technical skill. It's his ability to think critically. It's ability to communicate and work in a group, the collaboration aspect of it, because much of what you do is the students aren't doing this stuff on their own. They're not on their laptops writing their assignment. They're working together in a group. It's so important that they're doing that together. And, and I think one of the parts that I always kind of forget in these presentations to highlight is an area, uh, a learning section that we have called data management. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're, look, if you're hiring and you're looking at two resumes and one person says, I can use Excel efficiently, right? I can use Word. I can use tables. I can use a Premiere, I can use After Effects, I can use Photoshop, I can use Illustrator, InDesign, and you have someone that says, I can write really well, who are you going to hire? Right. So the, the data part of this is I always forget to get that in here, but we spend a good deal of time teaching Excel 
right? Yeah. How to create a production plan using tables inside of Word. There's a lot of those. I guess, do we call those soft skills now? There, there's a lot of, we could debate soft skills too. They're depth, yeah. Sometimes they're called soft skills. You're describing yeah. essential skills, right? That's so right. Frame of like, these are essential skills anymore, not optional soft skills. Yeah, um, and then just basic use of a computer, how to move around inside yeah. of a, a computer. Those are the things we forget to talk about uh, because, you know, but, but they're foundational to our work yeah. because people... You know, folks just want to see the end product, right? You know, and it's pretty and it's beautiful, but man, the journey to get there, you know, yeah. these students really have to work to get. Yeah. The, the interesting part for me is that the a term digital literacy is something that's been around for a long time. And um, it is yeah. foundationally uh, important for uh, educators and leaders to understand that it's tr changed. It doesn't mean the same thing it meant you know, 10 years ago, it meant how do you open a browser? How do you do a Google search? You know, how do you start, you know, your computer? Uh, it's really transformed into the areas of learning that you've actually exemplified today with the work that you've done. And so it is interesting that debate is still happening. You know, a lot of times the, the, we're always going to be, I feel in academia, there's, it's constant debate and everyone's going to kind of uh, change the way that they want to take what they've learned and bring it back to their campus, their classroom, their leaders, and describe it in a way that makes sense in the cultural language of where they live in their campus. Because that's really, really important. One phrase can't be describing it for everyone. Um, right. So, you know, you're, for Adobe and our partnership and where we've been working together, I really want to thank you for moving that idea forward in your institution and getting, uh, you know, other faculty to understand it, but also leadership to invest in the things that you're doing is a tremendous accomplishment because I know a lot of people in this group probably struggle to try to get people's attention to get that kind of support. So anyone who wants to learn how hard that was for Eddie, reach yeah. out to him because those are the things that you're going to have private conversations about. Those are about what's going on in your institutions, but he's a really great uh, person to lean on and to learn a little bit about what the struggles were. So there's a couple more questions before we go. We have about seven more minutes. See how fast all this passed? by uh so uh todd is what what can others learn from the success of you training 70 faculty like what are the key ingredients to faculty development that you feel um people need to uh, kind of learn about maybe the top two or top one you can just one ingredient what is that uh, on the, say, say again of how yeah, the that is, what yeah, so what can others learn from your success of training faculty, 70 fa 78 faculty, and what are the key ingredients to faculty development? What's the few things you feel are really important for someone to kind of put into their plan if they're gonna have to teach others how to do this? Well, the, the first thing is to build community. Right. right. So once you bring in, it's been amazing because you know, you've met my students at, at yeah. these conferences and they lead the training. Uh, they train faculty. Uh, you know, uh, Jacob talks about that all the time about how to get right. faculty on board, right? For right. what's going on. And so I think that creates a community of, of, of learners, right? And then they value this. And then the other thing for me, as a, you know, a bit of a guy that, wants things perfect sometimes, uh, you know, it's that old Joseph Campbell uh, notion of all of, you know, kind of like spirituality. It's not meant to push you back into all the things you already know. It's right. meant to push you out, right, into this vast knowledge and this vast sphere of learning and what other people bring to the table. So, as I have trained people, I think the most important thing is one, understanding time. And in many ways, it's my job to replace myself and that they're going to take it to another level. They're going to take it to a part that maybe I've not thought about or, right. you know, and you have to be able um, the, I think the most successful people are the people who are committed to making the people around them successful. Right. right. I mean, John Kennedy wrote about that in his book, Profiles of Courage. 
right? I mean, if I want to be successful, I have to be committed to make the other students in my group successful. Right. And if I do that, we all are going to be successful. So I would apply that to the faculty, the benefits of faculty training, yeah. right? Is once they, I mean, I didn't even get in to show you all the partnerships we have with faculty and stuff, right. but it's been amazing what they're doing. And then they'll send me projects that their students are doing. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, so, um, we have like four minutes left. One um, minute. We will end, I know it's gone by fast. One, one last question real quick. So can you speak to the differences from your perspective, and I don't know if you have one, uh, difference you see in digital literacy versus digital fluency? Uh, I don't know. Let's, um, I'd have to know more about why you're making that distinction. And I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, they're kind of the same thing to me. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I hear that a lot. I hear, you know, they, they're similar thing. One is more about applying it and practicing it. One's more about the foundation needed for people to be literate in a digital world. So I, I, yeah. I think, so this is classic, right? We're still debating. We're still talking. This is yeah. exactly what this Creators Campus Cafe was meant to do, was to introduce you to this audience. And I'm, yeah. this debate in your mind is over, but I think for a lot of people, there's still a lot of things they need to get to convince others that, you know, we need to be moving in this direction. So I really, really want to thank you. Uh, you've so, always offered your time to us and thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your day and sharing your experiences with everyone here um, at the Creative Campus Cafe. This is the first one we've done in 2020. We're going to do more of these. We're going to bring more uh, leaders on board. So Eddie, thank you so much um, yeah. for, for participating and sharing your thoughts and sharing what you're doing. Yeah. And you know, to that question, let me tell you, I'm old enough now. I learned to teach with a piece of chalk, you know. And I remember, I remember being in a meeting when our chair came in and said we're getting whiteboards, and there was a whole bunch of us that were like, "Whiteboard? What's a white? You know, how am I going to teach without a piece of chalk in my hand, writing the same thing over and over, you know, twenty times a day?" So yeah, so fluency or whatever the other part of that was, yeah. Drop well, the piece. I never got the pizza because I'm not an educator, but I got to clean the chalkboards from all my teachers. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been around a lot of have different, different experiences with the chalkboard. Eddie, thank you so much. Everyone, thank you very much for hanging in there. We have a lot of people in the room that stayed for the whole hour. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. This has been recorded. Go ahead. You have something to say, Eddie, before we sign yeah, off? Yeah. If, if there's a way that I could get a list of the people who attended. I would like to write them a thank you note for attending and make sure, you know, we have at least a nice handshake and connection that way. We will if absolutely try to do that. If everyone has opted into sharing, we will be more than happy to give you that information. Uh, but your contact info, everyone, if you're looking to get a hold of Eddie, uh, this link to his Spark page, Eddie has his contact info um in that spark page how to get a hold of him so make sure you go to the spark page to get a hold of eddie melissa i'm going to pass it off to you because we have kind of come to the last minute yeah wonderful thank you so much so much great discussion an abundance of information i appreciate everyone who's here and i appreciate you too as well so thank you so much for that so yeah, thank you again for being here. We do have a little short survey that we would love for you Please guys to fill program. out. So I have just put it in the chat right now. So if you could take a minute, it's just uh, two, two and a half short questions. <laughs> we would super love that. All right, last reminder, um, as Sebastian just said, this is being recorded and you will most certainly receive a follow-up email with today's recording and also some other helpful resources on digital literacy. Thank awesome. you again. Thank Hope you, everyone has a wonderful rest Thanks, of your day. Buddy. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Be safe. Be safe. Peace. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching. Click the link in the description below to explore more free online professional development and click the link on screen to subscribe to the channel for more videos.